Do you see me as one of you? Or do you see me and wonder who? As the fair-skinned child of a beautiful black mother, I learned about my race and identity at a very young age. It was important to my mother that strangers and even friends not think I was white, mixed, Creole, or Latina. I would have to fight my battles later in life relative to mistaken identity. But mom was determined to instill in me a strong sense of pride in being Negro or a colored child. My great grandfather was as dark as coal and my great grandmother as light as churned butter. Obviously, I take after my great grandmother. I was always aware of people who looked like me, like my mother, and who looked altogether different. Race was not subtle, it was ever present. And the rare times we ate out as a family at the Kresge's Five and Diner in Cincinnati, Ohio, it was common to have white customers stare at us. Little did they know my family represented a number of firsts. My dad was one of the first colored policemen to walk a beat in the city of Cincinnati. He knew his community, carried a nightstick, and never had to discharge his service revolver, or in other words, shoot someone. My mom was the first colored secretary to work for the all-white Cincinnati City Council. At age nine, I was one of the first two girls of color to integrate Bethany Episcopal School for Girls in Glendale, Ohio. It was within the walls of this faith-based school that at age 10, I came up close and personal with racism. My parents could not afford the tuition at Bethany, but a board member of the agency my mother worked for submitted a scholarship application and I was accepted first as a day student and then as a boarder. And a boarder meant that I lived there. I lived in one of the three cottages for several months. In addition to excellent academics, we had daily chapel, meals in a dining room, and learned how to set a table and have good table manners. As a boarder, we were assigned daily chores. One particular Saturday, I was scheduled for dusting and sweeping. I was poking along, singing, and out of nowhere, a white boarder said to me, I thought niggers could work better. In shock and total disbelief, I demanded, what did you say? Without hesitation, she said even louder, you heard me. With that, I punched her, she screamed, and one of the nuns came running to her defense. I remember being so shaken I couldn't speak for a few minutes, and when I was finally able to blurt out what had happened, as equal punishment, we were made to scrub the bathroom floor with a toothbrush. Remember, we were both age 10. The nun explained that my act of hitting the girl was as wrong as her ugly words. However, I did not see the punishment as fair. But then as years went by being a woman of color, I learned too often to deal with unfair. Many years later, I came to understand that this child did not come up with the name nigger on her own. She had to have heard it and heard it more than once. I wondered about her home and her parents and whether this blatant expression of racism at such a young age continued in her life as an adult. I can only wonder. Growing up, there were no dolls that looked like me. I loved to read, but there were no characters or heroines in books that looked like me either. The summer of fifth grade, I read Gone with the Wind, all 1,037 pages of it. The black women, Mammy and Prissy, did not read like how I was taught to speak. 
did not look like I imagined and portrayed a stereotype that was degrading and subservient. Butterfly McQueen, who played the character Prissy, once said during an interview, I didn't mind being funny, but I resented being cast as stupid. I once heard the comedian D.L. Hughley say, it isn't what you're called, but what you answer to. My answer to white folk who say, I didn't know you were black. Answer, now that you know, what have you learned? Let me be crystal clear. I have never wanted to pass as white or be thought of as white. In fact, as a young woman, I got fighting mad with my black friends and family, making the comment, girl, I didn't know who you were at first, looking like a white woman. Being viewed by white folks as one of them is one thing. Being viewed as white by your own is quite another. It is hurtful, it is painful, and even isolating. Passing is not, in my definition, an economic advantage. It is a choice, and I choose to seize opportunities like this to educate, train, teach, and when necessary, even preach. Answer to being the fair-skinned child of a beautiful black mother, I am proud to be a beautiful black woman.